Well, good morning, everybody. It's Father John Wilson on this um, Friday, May 8th. Um, we're continuing our series on the life of Servant of God, Mary Teresa Tallon. Um, so August 15th, 1920. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the day that the parish visitors of Mary Immaculate consider their, um, uh, their foundation. Uh, their foundation day. So they're actually coming up on their their hundredth anniversary real soon. Because uh, this was the day when um, Mother Talon, um, actually having been dispensed from her vows uh, as a sister of, of the Holy Cross, um, moves in with uh, a group of young women that she had already gathered around her in, in, during her New York City years. Um, begins to live a, a common life with them um, as they uh, start their work. Uh, they, they're living in a, you know, I think they've jumped around a couple times in those first early years. Um, I'll have to check my notes, but their, their first real convent or house, uh, mother house, was um, on West 71st Street in Manhattan. Um, so th this is a time of, of excitement, um, of uh, great graces from from God, but it's also a time of um, uncertainty. Not not so much about the call itself uh, to this new foundation, but uh, the details are, are very transitional. Um, so one thing that's going on is um, that they're they're not living under um, you know formal religious vows anymore. Um, Mother Talon had been, had been dispensed um, from her vows, the vows she made. And this is, you know, it's not like she just threw them off. Um, you know, that would be terrible. But, um, you know, there was a process whereby the, the bishop actually um, dispensed her by his authority um, in order to start this new work. Um, but it meant that for a period of time, a number of years, in fact, she... She was not technically a religious sister, uh, and you know if you actually look at her letters, um, she starts signing them again, um, Miss Julia Talon, which is which which is her her birth name. Um, but she was certainly still um, thought of herself as bound to those vows, and and still living the the spirit of those vows, um, in the expectation of being able to solemnly profess them again. Uh, but, you know, at least for a, a few years, technically, in the eyes of the church, this was just a, it was a group of pious women living together um, with the blessing of the bishop, um, Cardinal Hayes of, of New York, you know, in order to do some, some pious work and to be formally re erected as a religious order, um, uh, took a few more years. Um, the the church would have to approve their uh, their constitutions. Uh, this is actually something that a, a bishop can do. It didn't have to like go all the way to Rome right away. Uh, there are um, there are local religious communities, um, and that's what the um, the parish visitors of Mary Immaculate were until uh, until the nineteen eighties. In fact. Um, but even though they, they didn't have that, that formal approval of their constitutions, they were uh, certainly didn't want to wait uh, in order to uh, start the work that God had called them to. Um, another point of uncertainty, uh, at least at first, was the, um, the practical shape uh, of the work they were doing. Right? Remember, uh, Mother Talon's call was um, to the neglected, to those who had fallen through the cracks, um, you know, Catholics who needed to be invited back to, to embrace their faith. Um, and, and especially the, the poor, right? These are the, the families she encountered through working with the, the problem cases in her, you know, religious education duties, you know, kids from broken home, homes. So her inspiration for this work came through her, her time as a teacher, uh, but the parish visitors uh, did not become a, a teaching order. Um, instead, what would happen is that they would be invited by the, the pastor of a parish uh, to come in and 
what got them actually going around knocking on doors was that the um they they would be taking the uh, the, the quote unquote the, the parish census you know the the pastor would want to know okay who are who are the people and especially who are the catholics who live in my parish you know they're they're actually defined parish boundaries and um that you know so they would they had some questions to ask as they were going in but what they were really looking for is souls souls that needed to be invited back into a living relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ in his church. And so, you know, they, and so they, you know, had lots of stuff to report back to the parish priests about, uh, because, uh, and, and to, um, you know, actually invite people, hey, can I, you know, can, can a priest follow up with you about this? Um, you know, it's, it, we'd love to have him hear your confession. We'd love to have your, your children baptized, that sort of thing. So, so the, the, this was the, the practical um, mechanism, was this parish census. Um, but at the same time, at, at least at first, they're also um, under the, the supervision of um, uh, Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New York, um, which had been founded relatively um, recently. Uh, and they, they had actually started training, like formal... Um, graduate level training in uh, the sort of the relatively new field of, of social work. They actually took classes at the, the Fordham School of, of Social Work. And there were good reasons for this. You know, they having that kind of technical training, you know, gave them things to look out for. Uh, again, if they're going to be, you know, entering into, you know, broken homes, um, homes where there are like serious problems, perhaps even, you know, drinking, violence, that sort of thing. Uh, you you kind of like have to learn how to look for signs. This you know this is what you know social workers will tell you even these days. And uh, their their relationship with Catholic charities was also made a, a certain kind of sense, right? You know they they're entering into the homes of the poor, and and the church wants to see the poor. Um, you know, relieved of their suffering and, and give practical help. The corporal works of mercy have always been what the church has been about. And so, you know, hey, if this, this new group of women is going to be going into these homes, it's good to know. It's good to be able to link them with the, the practical support that they need. Um, but there was a problem. And the, the problem was that, you know, and Mother Talon struggled in those first few years. Um, ne never, never in public, but um, to to keep the actual mission of her community what it what it what it was meant to be that you know fundamentally the the sisters aren't social workers they're 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 missionaries they're they're there to win souls for Christ. Um, in a certain sense, all religious founders have have had this tension right. As soon as you start getting organized to do some good work in the church, you know, all these people will start coming and saying, hey, look, there's that group over there that wants to be helpful. This is how they can fit in with my plans. Um, and that, that happened to her. Um, and, but she, she, she had to gently resist um, because the, the true source of authority um, in you know, in this work was the Holy Spirit, um, of course, overseen by the church's legitimate pastors. And this is why it was, it was such a relief and such a blessing for the community when their their constitutions were finally approved on the diocesan level. This is, I think, 1927, and they're able to, you know, fully live as, as religious um, uh, and, and sort of embrace that identity fully. Um, you know, there's another aspect to all of this too, right? Um, and this is something that we as the church always have to be be attentive to. You know, there, there's such a temptation when we're trying to do good work to do it only in the measurable ways, right? Only in the, the ways that will um, that we can actually sort of point to a point to a concrete result. And what that often leads to is doing it in the, 
the human ways, the, the, the natural ways, the, the supernatural element. You know, you, you, you can't make up an Excel spreadsheet of souls reconciled to God, even though that's what the mission of ch the church is. Um, so there's always that temptation to kind of like that, that sort of bureaucratic mentality. And this is kind of what she was fighting against. And it's, it's what we need to fight against too especially as, as we're being called in this time to go out and seek the lost and bring them back into the, the fold of the church. Um, but um, Mother Talon, um, she understood this. And she, she had a, a very dis powerful vision for what her community was going to be. And she, she started training her sisters in that vision right away. Uh, you know, through her letters, even before 1920, and then um, once they were all together uh, through these these daily reflections, daily conferences, uh, really putting into putting out there everything God had been doing and teaching her about uh, the way of perfection from her her first days as a religious. Um, in these, you know, these these great gifts she would give to her sisters in these daily talks and. Um, this is really where I came to to first know her and love her. It is actually reading these conferences. Um, they they were actually you know printed and published uh, a while ago, and uh, I got to uh, got to read some of them. And, and like that's that's actually where I want to start going with these talks. I want to share some reflections from from her actual writings uh, because they're they're great spiritual treasures and I'm excited to share them with you. God bless you guys. I'll see you tomorrow.